So for who is taking this uh, workshop for uh, grades, um, I'm going to send you um, a questionnaire at the end of the three days. So it's a 10 questions. Uh, it's 10 questions. So uh, this is like uh, one of the assignment you will have. So uh, you will have a questionnaire plus a, a homework. Um, so the homework will be uh, uh, writing a report of the of the in, per, in person not this time, but the online lab experience. Um, so uh, I don't need like the, the details of the protocol I'm going to perform. So I don't need you to list you know how many microliters you use for uh, reagents one enzyme whatever. I, I just want to make sure that you understand why I'm yeah, like I'm performing that specific step. So I want you to list all the main steps of a library prep and uh, also had like couple, two, three lanes just to explain uh, the main goal of this, that specific step, the expected results and why um, it's important to um, perform that step. Um, okay, so this is um, what we are talking today uh, about today more in detail. So as I told you, introduce sequencing technologies uh, and then uh, we will go more in detail about the library prep and also uh, sequencing means we will see uh, what, what are the parameters for the sequencing and how to communicate with the sequencing core and what to say uh, to the sequencing core when you want to submit your samples. Um, and then some of the specialty uh, DNA library prep for today uh, are the targeted sequencing. Um, and then we will also cover the PCR duplicate topic. Um, and then we will have a Kahoot. So Kahoot is just a, a, um, a live uh, quiz. It's anonymous, so it's just for fun. It's for just to review some, some of the concepts. Um, and then we will also have a mini quiz plus attendance. Uh, so the, the mini quiz is just for me, it's uh, mainly for me to um, see uh, if uh, I explain the concept fine, if you are taking like at least the main concept uh, from the class uh, and then um, for who is taking the, the class for credits. Uh, as I told you, I will send out 10 questions, uh, 10 questions at the end of the uh, workshop. However, let's say if, if you fail one of the questions, uh, I can go back to the mini quiz uh, of day one and two. And let's say that I can replace uh, one of the questions of the final quiz with one correct question from the mini quiz. So the mini quiz for, for who is attending the class for credit is not for, for bad, it's just for, for good, <laughs> okay? So if you fail the question, doesn't, I, don't, I don't care, doesn't matter, but they can be uh, useful like for the final quiz, for the after class quiz, okay? So all the questions are welcome. So please, I'll uh, ask all the questions you want. And I, I'll try to look at the chat box. Uh, however, um, uh, if I miss one of your questions or if you have questions even after class, uh, I uh, put a, a Excel sheet in the uh, Google Drive, I share it with you um, so you can just uh, put your email, uh, write your question, question and I, I'll try to answer uh, in the access sheet or with your uh, writing you an email. So um, please feel free to use the access sheet if you want. Okay, so let's start with a super brief intro to sequencing technologies. 
Um, first of all, let's say that no step in uh, uh, sequencing experiment is an island. What does it mean? Um, so as you can see on the right, we have the main step uh, in a uh, sequencing experiment. So we have the uh, starting material means how we prepare the samples. Uh, so it can be RNA, DNA, single cell, chromatin. And the starting material is affecting um, how we are going to prepare the libraries, how we are going to sequence uh, our final product. At the same time, the library prep is going to affect the analysis and the sequencing uh, will can affect for how you um, how you decide to prepare your library and how you will analyze your data. So every uh, every step, each step will af affect somehow all the other steps. And um, this workshop, so um, the library prep part, is the only workshop that covers uh, what's happening before uh, the analysis. So everything happens before generating the final date. Um, okay, so we have three main, uh, three uh, sequencing generation. So the first one, first generation sequencing is the uh, Max, Max and Gilbert or Sanger sequencing. Um, so uh, how it works, we have an original DNA sequence or PCR amplified uh, uh, fragment, and uh, we are going to use fluorescently labeled uh, D-deoxynucleotide. Um, and then we'll have, um, so these uh, D-deoxynucleotides are uh, modified. Uh, so that means that the polymerase can add just one nucleotide at a time. So we will have, we will obtain uh, fragments of different lengths and they differ by, uh, as you can see, like by one nucleotide. Uh, so next uh, we will, we are going to separate the, them uh, in a capillary gel. So the sh shortest fragment will migrate faster, the bigger, bigger fragment will uh, migrate um, slower. And then we will have a la laser at the end. So uh, we will see, uh, like we, we will have the sequencing is going to detect um, the, uh, signal, and we will have we will obtain a chromatogram that will tell us the exact sequence of the initial fragment. Uh, so we will obtain this consensus sequence at the end. Um, uh, um, is as you can see, is not high throughput, so it's just one sequence at a time. Then we have the next generation sequencing or second generation sequencing. Uh, the two main leader, leaders on the market are uh, Ion Torrent and Illumina. Uh, so the, the principle, so how they work is slightly is, is different. So Ion Torrent, um, um, it, so we have a, a hydrogen ion that are released after uh, uh, base is added. Uh, so the machine is going to detect the change in the pH, but this kind of, this technique has some problem with the uh, homo uh, polymers. So that means uh, sequence that have the same, se uh, sequence that have consecutive identical bases. So when, when you have uh, consecutive identical bases. It's hard for this um, technique to uh, exact say how many of that specific nucleotide you have. So can make 
uh, can it can make me stay. Um, the Illumina uh, platform, uh, if you look at the literature, uh, it's like, let's say maybe 90, maybe even more percent of the uh, next generation sequencing experiments use the Illumina uh, platform. Uh, so the characteristics of uh, the Illumina platforms uh, are, um, uh, so uh, it needs short reads. Uh, it's high throughput, so you can obtain million of reads. It's a low error rate uh, approach, uh, and it's characterized by um, uh, sequencing by synthesis, and it requires uh, amplification before sequencing. And we will discuss uh, this too in a bit. Uh, but uh, the next generation sequencing is not for uh, read uh, native modifications. Then we have the third generation sequencing. So the two main uh, platforms are uh, Oxford Nanopore and PacBio. Uh, so it, it again is, uh, is not like, so for the Illumin and Ion Torrent, we have Million, millions of molecules. Here is just a single molecule sequencing. It's, but it's real time. It's for longer reads. Has a higher error rate compared to the next generation sequencing. <clears throat> and isn't, you're not going to obtain this million of reads you obtain with the next generation sequencing, but it can read native modifications. Um, so it really depends on your experiments if you uh, if you are going to use the third generation sequencing or uh, second generation sequencing. Um, so about the third generation sequencing, PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. Uh, they are uh, quite different. Uh, for Ox Oxford Nanopore, it's uh, a really cheap technology. Uh, so the, the instrument, it uh, looks like a USB drive. So it's really uh, small, um, cheap. Um, and uh, the principle is, so you have um, uh, me membranes uh, with pores that can move the DNA uh, and the measurement of the resistance across the membrane uh, informs you about the base that is transitioning through the pore. Uh, about PAC biome, uh, here we have a DNA polymerase that, uh, that is attached to the support uh, and the well is this well is specifically designed to detect the addition of a single fluorescently labeled uh, nucleotide. Okay, but the the, the main difference uh, with the second generation sequencing is they can like the third generation sequencing can read native modifications. So native modifications are, for example, for the DNA is the five. Uh, methyl cytosine, so the methylation of the, uh, of the DNA, and for the um, uh, RNA, uh, for example, we have the N6 uh, methyl adenine uh, modification. So uh, that's uh, something that can be important depending on your experiment. Okay, so uh, this work workshop is about NGS. So I'm going to um, uh, give you some more details about the uh, Illumina platform. Uh, okay, so um, here um, in gray, uh, in the uh, figure here in, on the top left, uh, in gray we have our DNA, uh, so it's important for the Illumina platform to add the adapters to our DNA uh, fragments. Uh, then um, the Illumina platform uh, has this um, support 
with uh, primers attached to it that are complementary uh, to the adapters on our fragments. So these primers on the support are going to capture our uh, fragments. Then we will have the amplification we were talking about previously. So um, we will uh, amplify our fragments uh, and that's important because uh, one single fragment of DNA cannot give us um, uh, a, a strong enough signal to be detected. So what we are want to obtain are clusters, so groups of, uh, say, of the same exact sequence. So the cluster is able to uh, generate a strong enough signal to be detected from the sequencing machine. So once we obtain the cluster, uh, we, uh, the, the, the instrument is going to start with the first chemistry cycles. That means that we are going to add uh, label uh, nucleotides uh, and then we will have, and then we will have a laser uh, that is going to um, um, excite the uh, label nucleotide and uh, the machine is going to detect uh, the signal. And the signal looks like uh, the picture here. So we will have dots, dots of different colors, uh, each color for one single nucleotide. So for the first cycles, we will detect the image and we will, uh, the, the instrument is going to, uh, rec to uh, record the, the, the first nucleotide of the sequence. And then we will have a second cycle, third cycle, and same for the uh, entire length of the read. Um, okay. Uh, so here, I just wanted to give you an overview of the, all the available Illumina uh, machines. Um, okay, so in the previous slide, I was uh, showing you the bridge amplification, and this was like a glass support. Um, so uh, starting with the iSeq machine, uh, the instruments looks like looks slightly uh, different. So we don't have a glass support. Now we have a pattern flow cells. So this is how each single lane looks like. Um, and uh, so each, in each well, we, we are going to have a single cluster of molecules. So the, the signal um, uh, that comes for each, uh, from each well will be coming from one fragment. Um, and this is how a flow cell looks like. So we, in, for the iSeq machine, we have eight lanes um, and uh, each lane has uh, more or less uh, 480 million of cells. Okay, so any question on that? Questions? No? Okay, so let's move. Okay, so let's go to part one of the library prep. Um, okay, so these three are the main um, features that a uh, library needs to have to be sequenced on a Illumina platform. So first of all, we need to have DNA. Okay, so uh, for today, we are going to talk about DNA library prep. Uh, so we don't need to worry about having DNA because we are starting from genomic DNA in this uh, graph here. So that's fine. We are talking about more in detail about how to obtain the DNA tomorrow when we are going to um, uh, 
um, explain more about the RNA uh, library prep. Then we need uh, the uh, fragments to be short, okay? So next generation sequencing equal short fragments. So the average is usually between 200, 800 base pair. Um, third feature, we need to modify our fragments adding the adapters. So if we don't have adapters uh, ligated to our DNA fragments, they are not going to be, um, they're not going to be processed in a NGS uh, platform. Okay, so um, we are starting from genomic DNA to obtain short fragments. We are going to have a fragmentation step and to modify our DNA with adapters, we, going, we are going to have a ligation step. However, we have something in between. So from fragmentation, we cannot go directly to adapter ligation to obtain our final library. So we, we have some few extra step, steps. So first of all, uh, we need to uh, perform some quality control on our input uh, material. And then in between fragmentation and adapter ligation, we have another extremely important step. It, that's the end repair and a tailing. And uh, um, at, the, at the end, after we obtain our final library, we have another QC quality control uh, step. Um, so the, but let's say that these are the main steps for uh, any kind of uh, library prep. So fragmentation and repair, a tailing and adapter ligation. Okay, so let's talk about the quality control. So how uh, do we perform the quality control when we want to start our library prep? So we have different uh, strategies. So we can use a nanodrop. Maybe uh, some of you have already uh, used this instrument. Uh, so the nanodrop is a spectrophotometer. Um, so it detects the absorbance. Uh, so uh, nucleic acid is 260. Um, and the pro uh, of using a nanodrop is that it tells you the ratio uh, in the absorbance between nucleic acid that 260 or proteins that have an absorbance of 280 or any other uh, contaminant uh, that you can have in your mixture. Um, so it's giving you an, uh, an idea of the uh, how uh, uh, on a, an idea on how pure is your uh, RNA DNA preparation? Uh, the cons are consequences are uh, it's really inaccurate, especially for DNA, uh, especially if it's not clean enough, or if you have low low concentrated uh, samples. Um, then we have. Uh, a qubit uh, floater, fluorometer. So the qubit is an, uh, uh, an alternative to the nanodrop. Uh, the pro of using a qubit is that it's for sure more accurate and specific, especially for low concentrated samples. However, it does not give you uh, the uh, information about the contaminants, okay? So if Let's say if you're using a kit to extract your uh, DNA RNA, so uh, it's quite a controlled protocol. You probably don't need to use the nanodrop, but the qubit is uh, safe enough. Uh, but if you're performing a home, homemade protocol, maybe the information about the contaminants is 
uh, important too. Uh, then uh, about the quality of our starting material um, for like um, check the quality, we also need to uh, run a gel to see if our uh, DNA it's degraded or it's uh, not degraded. So we can do, or, or even if it has contaminants. So here on the left, we have an agarose gel. Um, so the, the DNA looks fine, but we also have in lane three, something on the bottom. That's usually when you have an RNA contamination, you see something on the bottom. Um, or instead of using an agarose gel, you can use a Agilent Tape Station genomic DNA. Uh, so the, the, the Agilent Tape Station, uh, we are going to talk about this instrument in day three more in detail, um, but it's like running an agarose gel, but the pro are with, in the Tape Station, you don't need to load that much of your uh, um, uh, DNA because it's because it's, it's re, uh, really sensitive. Uh, so you can use just a few microliters of your DNA. Uh, and it, also, it is also giving you uh, the DIN, DNA integrity number. So it is also telling you how, uh, um, like the quality of your DNA. So the DNA here on the right of the Agilent Tape Station uh, image is a good quality DNA. And then on the left, we have some fragmented samples. So let's say that for an NGS experiment, we really don't care about if it's fragmented or not, because uh, as we saw previously, uh, one of the main step of the library prep is fragmentation. But if you want to perform a third generation sequencing experiment, you have to uh, think about the uh, integrity of your DNA because you, are, you want to look at the full fragment. So if it's fra fragmented, that not, that's not good for a third generation sequencing experiment. Okay, so let's say that we obtain our purified genomic DNA, and then we want to go to the next step in our NGS experiment, that's fragmentation. So we have different strategies uh, for fragmentation. Uh, first one is nebulization. So I don't, I mean, I'm mentioning the, this first one, but I, I don't think anyone is actually performing this anymore. Um, then we have stonication. Um, uh, third one is uh, an enzymatic fragmentation, and then we have the chemical one. So stonication means using uh, ultrasound waves to break down your DNA. Um, so it's a mechanic approach. The enzymatic one is of course, an enzymatic approach. Um, they, so the, the approach is different, but also the, 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 result is, the result is different because sonication, so the mechanic approach, uh, it's quite random. Uh, so you, you don't have any bias on the mechanic approach. Uh, however, uh, sonication me, needs for you to have a sonicator available. So it's not always easy to have a sonicator available and uh, you, cannot you cannot perform the sonication on many samples. So there is a limitation in the number of samples and so it depends on the machine. Um, so uh, maybe you cannot process many samples together. By opposite, the enzymatic one, the enzymatic approach uh, allows you to uh, perform the fragmentation on 
even 96 samples because it's performed in a uh, thermocycler. So you can even process 96 samples together. Uh, but as you know, uh, the en enzymes, they have a consensus sequence. So they are going to cut your uh, DNA always in the same consensus sequence. So you, you can probably obtain a bias, especially uh, in the first uh, 10 nucleotides of your um, uh, sequence. Uh, however, uh, the mixture of enzymes commercially available uh, to perform the fragmentation steps are uh, modified to reduce at the to reduce the bias you you can have, but you you will still see some. So as you can see here on the right, figure A and B. Uh, so the physical um, approach you don't have any bias, but in the enzymatic one, you can still have, have some. Um, and uh, about the chemical fragmentation, this is usually uh, used for the RNA library prep. Okay, so uh, once we obtain the uh, short, um, fragments. Uh, next, we need to modify this fragment with adapters. Uh, as I told you, we cannot go from fragmentation to adapter ligation directly. We need the end repair and A tailing. But before talking about the end repair and A tailing more in detail, uh, I think it's important to uh, look at how the adapters uh, looks like, okay? So how the Illumina adapters uh, uh, look like. So um, here on the left, we have uh, the structure of the Illumina adapters. Um, so we have, uh, there are like uh, many uh, different um, regions that are are important uh, in the library prep process. Uh, so first of all, the, the region that is here in the green box, um, it's important for the sample multiplexing. So what does it mean? Um, so the, the green, uh, the region here in green, these two segments, the brown and red one, they are the index, index one, index two. So during the library prep, what uh, we are going to do is label each sample uniquely, okay? So we can add one index or the best is to add two uh, indices um, to the sample. And they will be the co they can be both unique or the combination of the two needs to be unique. So you you will be able to um, know uh, at the end of the sequencing experiment uh, where the fragments are coming from, which sample. Okay. So here, for example, we have. Okay, let's say that purple is sample one, blue is sample two, orange uh, is sample three. Uh, so when, when we are going to sequence our sample, we are going to put them together. So this is the multiplexing. So to save on the sequencing costs, we want to put the samples together. So in order to be able, after the sequencing, when we look at the data to separate them again, we need to label each sample uniquely. So the, the combination of index one and index two needs to be different for each sample. Then we have the uh, regions in the red 
box here, P5 and P7. So these two are the um, sequence that are important for the uh, flow cell binding. So the flow cell in the Illumina machine and the PCR amplification. So these two are called amplification regions and are important for the sequencing itself and for the PCR um, during the library prep. So third feature, the Illumina adapters are Y-shaped. As you can see here, we have the extreme part of the Illumina adapters are not complementary, okay? These two regions are not complementary. So we have a Y shape. Why? Why we need to have a Y shape adapters? Okay, so when we are going to uh, put our samples uh, in the sequencing machine, uh, we will have uh, a first step of amplification, okay? Um, so if we use linear double-strand DNA, we can have different combinations. So we can have, so P5 here is orange, P7 is green. So we can have a orange-green combination, or we can have a green-green, green, orange, or orange, orange. So because, uh, so we, so here only the uh, fragments who have, um, does, uh, that have a green and orange uh, adapters will be, amplified and will be sequenced. So half of the combination, so the green, green and uh, orange, orange one, won't be amplified and won't be sequenced. So we are actually going to lose some of the information coming from our samples if we use linear double-strand DNA, because it depends on how the primers that we are using for the amplification are designed. So if we have green green, the amplification is not going to happen. Okay, so we, we will lose the information from these two. Uh, by opposite, like in the Y, if we have the Y shape uh, adapters, we will always have the orange green combination for all of them. So we are not going to lose anything here. So we will have 100% of the information. Okay, and then uh, let's go to the last one, last uh, region that's important in the Illumina adapters is the one in the blue box here. So the, the, the region that has these three prime uh, overhang with that T and a five phosphate, okay? So this is the region that's important, extremely important for the ligation step. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. So if we have a T overhang, and a phosphate at the five prime and what, what do we need uh, on the other end? So our, like the fragments that we want to ligate here, how the fragments should looks, look like? Um, I guess you would have to have a A there or add it to your fragment. Yes. Exactly. Okay, since we have a T over N, we need that A on the opposite uh, side, okay? So we need that A at the three prime of our insert and another five uh, 
phosphate at the five prime end, okay? So that's why it becomes important to have an end repair and a tailing uh, step here. So when we uh, fragmented our DNA in the really first step of the library prep, uh, we, we, we are not obtaining uh, blunt ends, but in, to have a, a highly efficient adapter ligation step, we need to have blunt ends. So the end repair and ATLing step, it's actually um, um, the step necessary to uh, obtain the blunt ends and adding a A at the three prime end and a phosphate at the five prime end. So how does it work? How the end repair and A tailing work? So we can have two, um, so case number one, so the, the, the orange one, so we can have a five prime over N or we can have a three prime over N, okay? So we want to obtain blunt ends. So first step is blunting, let's call it blunting. So what we, we are going to use is a T4 polymerase. So the T4 DNA polymerase can fill in five, in this direction, five, five prime to three prime. So in the orange fragment is going to fill in the gap, but the T4 DNA polymerase cannot fill in in the three prime, five prime direction, but together with the D DNA polymerase activity, the T4 polymerase has a um, exonuclease activity, okay? So in the three prime, five prime end, uh, five, prime, uh, five prime direction, the T4 polymerase will remove the three prime uh, over end. So thanks to the T4 polymerase, we can obtain blunt ends. So now we can use a T4 PNK, so a kinase, uh, to add the phosphate at the five prime end. And then as the really last step, we are going to use a clano or TAC polymerase to add the A over N. Okay. So now our insert is ready for the ligase step. We have T here, A, the phosphate at the bo both ends, and we can finally obtain our final library. So we have DNA, it's short, and it's modified with adapters. So it's ready for sequencing. Okay, do you have any questions on that? Okay, so let's say that it's already a lot to <laughs> think about. Um, and I want to give you a break. Um, so let's take a break and uh, start in, again in 10 minutes. So I'm here if you have any question, but if you need to drink water or whatever, we, have, we are having 10 minutes break. Okay, so if there are no questions on the first part of the library prep, I'm going to move to the 
in library press part two. Okay, so we discussed about the unrepair and age aiding. We covered the adapter ligation. So we have our final library. But we, we can also have a PCR step. So why? Why do we need, we need PCR? So let's say that PCR introduce biases actually. So it introduces a useless duplicated weights. So if possible, it's always better to avoid uh, performing PCR. But or anyway, another strategy is to uh, perform a qPCR to so monitor uh, how many cycles we actually need to have enough signal from our sample. Uh, because as a general uh, rule, uh, the fewer the better. So PCR is not really uh, helping our experiment. Um, however, sometimes uh, the PCR is necessary. So when, for example, uh, when we, 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 we are starting with a low amount of DNA, so we, we don't have that much DNA to work with, uh, like, I don't know if you're performing experiment with, let's say, cell free DNA. So, cell free DNA, DNA is not that much as you can find in cells or tissues. Uh, so, you will probably need some PCR at the end of the library prep in order to have enough um, con a concentrated library to work with. Um, or um, sometimes uh, it's necessary uh, to add the index information uh, because, okay, so we, we, are, we talk about the okay, full Y adapters, um, Illumina adapters previously, but we can also have for some application that is called Stabi Y adapters. So these adapters, they do not contain the P5 and um, index information. So the P5, P7 and index information is going to be actually add with the PCR. So that's why here, the PCR is necessary. So it's not an option, we need the PCR. Okay, so once we obtain our final libraries, uh, as we saw in the really first um, uh, scheme I was showing you, um, we have another step of quality control. So we add a quality control step at the really beginning of the uh, experiment to um, look at the quality of our starting material. And now we need a quality control step to uh, look at the final product, okay? So first of all, we need to look at the size distribution presence of adapters dimers or primer dimers in our mixture. And we, we can do that using an Agilent tape station or bioanalyzer instrument or an agarose gel, okay? So agarose gel is not really recommended because uh, first of all, it's not sensitive as the Agilent is tape station or bioanalyzer. So you will probably need to uh, load on the gel most of your uh, product. Uh, and let's think about, okay, you run a, a agarose gel 
and then you need to purify your product again from the agarose gel. So it's like another uh, unnecessary step and you will probably also lose uh, some of your sample. So why is the agarose gel? When you can just you know, perform the same uh, quality control um, step using our Nagevent tape station. Uh, so for final libraries, uh, there is the D1000 uh, tape station tape that, that requires only one microliter of your final library and you can keep the, the rest, okay? Um, then we have to measure the concentration of our final library. And we, okay, we have different strategies here. So we have, we can measure uh, the concentration using the qubit, so fluorometer, uh, or we can use a BDPCR or qPCR. Of course, these two are extremely accurate uh, because you are going to just, you know, using specific primers, you are going to measure your DNA only. The, the, your final library only because it's specific for your final libraries. Qubit, it does measure you know, the total DNA in your mixture. So for example, if you have adapter dimers, uh, you will also measure them. So Qubit is less accurate, but of course, adapter dimers, primer dimers, it's something that you can remove before measuring the concentration. So actually the qubit is still the best option. So once you, if you have them, you remove the adapter dimers and primer dimers, you can use the qubit uh, because it's also the, the cheapest option you have. Three, uh, you will probably need to dilute your samples. Uh, so once you have the size of your fragments and the concentration of your library, you can calculate the molality. Uh, so you can, based on the molality, prepare dilute, prepare your sample for sequencing. Okay, so this is a picture from a Nagelan tape, tape station instrument. Um, so it, it really looks like an agarose gel. So they, it's a gel, okay? So the, here, A, B, C, we have three different experiments. Um, so on the top, we have our final libraries. And here we have PCR primer dimers. So that's the size of the PCR primer dimers. Or in B, we have adapter dimers. Okay. So the, our goal is to obtain less than 1% of this contaminant. So if they are less than 1% compared to the whole mixture of DNA we have in our sample, it's not a big deal. Otherwise we need to remove them, okay? So final libraries, the size range is in between 200 to 700 base pair usually. Uh, and then you have adapter dimers uh, between one, 2140 base pair and primer dimers are usually below 100 base pair. So, um, why? So, I, I say we need less than the, the, the contaminants to be less than 1%. So, why? So, why, why do we need to remove the adapters? So, what's the goal? I and mean, what's the advantage of removing the adapter dimers or primer dimers? 
any doubts? Okay, so first of all, it will be a waste of weight. Even if we are, of course, going to align our final products or our reads to our reference genome. So we will know we, like the reads that are coming from our samples, we can separate them from the reads that are coming from adapters or PCR diamonds, uh, PC, um, primary diamonds, sorry. We can do that, but if we have adapter dimers or primary dimers in our sample, some of the reads will be just a waste of reads, okay? So we don't need that. We, they are not giving us any information about our samples. And of course, it's going to be also a waste of money because um, the sequencing uh, output uh, will be contaminated from useless reads. Uh, finally, um, it's important to remove them because we can have an effect that is called index popping. So index misassignment. What does it mean? So here on the left, you can see how the uh, uh, multiplexing and alignment step should work. So once we demultiplex our reads, so we know that the blue ones uh, are coming from sample one and part four, the, 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 the fragments with the purple adapters are coming from sample number two. We are going to align the reads and go uh, further with the analysis. If we have um, index, like free index uh, in our mixture, we can have index poking. So here we, we don't have only like the blue fragments, but we can have something like this or this. So we have a blue index and purple index mix because there were the like the index there was a index opening, um, index opening, uh, and we are miss assigning the reads. Okay. So now the, 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 fra the orange fragment that was coming from sample number two has been assigned to sample one. Same here for sample two, we have one fragment coming from sample one that because of the purple index was misassigned. So of course the index open is it will, it will affect the whole experiment, even the um, analysis, okay? So that's why it's really, really important to remove them. So how, how we can remove the PCR uh, dimers or primary dimers or uh, adapters dimers. So we need a purification step. And we can purify our uh, libraries using two different strategies. We can use a column or we can use the ampere beads. Okay? So let's start with this with the column. So the principle uh, here is that, okay, so we, in the column, we have a, a membrane that's able, it's modified, of course, so it's able to capture, specifically capture the DNA uh, in present, like the DNA when it's resuspended in a 
binding buffer. So once the DNA is captured from the column, we can wash the DNA and then elute the DNA and add purified DNA, okay? However, the spin column can help with the dimers, but is not that efficient. So it can still capture even the primary dimers or adapter dimers. Okay, so we can we cannot 100% accurately remove the dimers using a spin column especially if they are really high concentrated, okay? So Ampure beads is our second option to purify our uh, library. So here we have magnetic beads. Of course, the, those uh, magnetic bits are modified to be able to capture the DNA. So the surface of the magnetic bits is modified. So they can, and they are resuspended in a particular buffer. So to allow the bits to capture the DNA. Then what we can do is separate the bits using, using a magnet. So we will separate the beads that have captured the DNA from the sur, uh, surnatant. So we can remove everything else except the fragments we capture, wash with ethanol, and then as last step, we can elute our fragments from the beads. So the elution buffer is going to break down um, the connection between the DNA and the magnetic beads. So again, we can separate the beads with the magnet in, in step here in step five. Now the magnets are um, free, so without any DNA attached to them. Uh, to them. And we can just uh, collect the DNA and keep it, okay? So what's the advantage of using the beads? So the advantage is that we can actually choose the size of the DNA we want to capture. And it only depends on the ratio between our DNA solution and the bead solution. So if we use, uh, okay, so here is 0.8x corresponds to a 300 base pair. So if we use a 0.x volume of beads, we can capture the 300 base pair fragments. It's usually the size of our final library. And everything else, so all the contaminants that are usually in this range here, to capture them, we, we will need a 1.2x of it. So of course, we are not going to use this amount of bits ever when we want to purify our, our final library. But let's say that at 0 0.8 or one, X of beads is uh, usually perfect uh, to purify, efficiently purify the final library uh, from any contaminants. Okay, so beads preferentially bind long DNA. So why they preferentially bind long DNA? So if you have one fragment is like this, really long, and one fragment is like this. So if the fragment is really long, you will have multiple regions, multiple, 
yes, regions that can be captured from the beads. So you have a, a bigger surface. There. So the, be the beads can, ca can capture this fragment more efficiently. If you have a smaller fragment, you have less chance of capturing this fragment. So if you use just 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, so a, a little amount of bits, um, you will just capture the longest fragment, okay? Okay, so here there is a uh, standard workflow for DNA library prep. It's mostly what we discuss uh, during uh, this library prep uh, part of the workshop. Uh, as, as you can see, this is our old workflow. So um, we had, we usually had to perform many purification steps. So you have fragmentation and repair and then purification. And then you have a tailing, adapter ligation, and again, purification, PCR purification. You have three steps of purification. So, I mean, it's not bad to have purification step, but, I mean, if we can reduce them, it's better just because for like any, any purification step, we, are, we can lose some of our uh, library. So um, there are like more recent uh, kits that have this streamlined workflow. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the protocol we are going to uh, look at in day three. So this protocol has um, a, a DNA fragmentation and polishing step. It's fragmentation, A-tailing, and everything, everything in one step. And then the adapter ligation, so we will have just two purification instead of three, okay? And this is an enzymatic fragmentation. Okay, so question on that? Library prep part two. Okay, so let's have some fun. Okay, so I'm going to share with you um, a hoot. It's just a mini quiz for question, only to review some of the concepts we covered in this class so far. Um, okay. okay, so uh, let's mute this. Okay. So if you want to participate in the Kahoot, you just need to go to kahoot.it, okay? And it will ask you for a game here. And you can add this field here. So if you want to play, it's anonymous, so no, no one will know who is playing. It's just to review some of the concept of the workshop and without grades, without any stress, just for fun.
condição. Okay. Okay, let's go. First question is coming. First question is which step is not required after sonication before ligating the adapters in a DNA library prep? So which step? is not required. So there is more than one correct answer here. So we have end repair, PCR, in vitro transcription, or ATA. So sonication means fragmentation, right? So sonication is one of the strategies you can used to fragment our DNA. So before the adapter ligation, which step is not required? There are two correct answers here. Okay. Yes, exactly. So we have, so we don't need PCR. The, is going to be, if necessary, our really last step. So it's going to be after ligation and we don't need in vitro transcription, okay? Good. Okay. Next question. What information do you use to separate DNA seq libraries one sequence in one layer? So this is about the multiplexing, okay? So we put our sample together before sequencing and then we, after sequencing, we want to separate them. Good. Yes, correct. Indices or buckets. So that, that's the information we need to separate our samples after sequencing. Okay. Which of the following is not a feature of the NGS technology, okay? So NGS technology is second generation technology. Um, there is only one correct answer here. So what are the feature of the NGS? So only one is not, doesn't belong to NGS. So correct answer is carried native modification. So native modifications is something you can look at only with the third generation sequencing, okay? So the, the uh, features of next generation sequencing are short reads. So as we saw uh, in the gel uh, for our final library, the, the range is usually to under 800 base pairs, so they are short reads. And of course, we, we already, we also fragmented our genomic DNA, so they need to be short reads. It's low error rate, is high throughput, but no. Second generation sequencing is not for massive modification. Okay, last question. What is the usual size of contaminants in a standard DNA library prep? We just discussed about it. So this is the picture I showed you before. So what the usual size, and we have two correct answers here again, okay? So we can have PCR, primer dimers, or adapter dimers. So what's the size of the, Primary dimers and adapter dimers. Yes, correct. 50 base pair is the usual size for PCR primary dimers. 130 can be 
uh, the average size for uh, adapter dynamics. Okay. Okay, third, please. Second, first. Good job to the smiling face. <laughs> okay, so thank you for playing with me. Okay, so let's go back to the slides now. Okay, so let's go to the sequencing um, part of the workshop. So now we are going to talk about more in detail about uh, how to sequence our final product and uh, which parameters uh, we need to look at and how to communicate with the sequencing core, okay? Um, okay, so we have our final library here, and we have P5, P7 at the end. And we have the index one and two, and we have, we can, we have read one and read two. So read one and read two are the read for your insert, so your, uh, your the fragment that is coming from um, your samples. So we can sequence single ends, means that we want the information that belongs to read one only, so just one read, and it can be single and 50, single at 100. This is the length of the read we need, okay? So we can set this to be 50 or 100. It depends on our experiment and we are going to talk about it in a set. Um, so first parameter is about this insert. So if we only want to read one, we need to sequence single end. If we want both the reads, we need to sequence pair end. So we are going to read one and two, and even pair end can be pair end 50, pair end 100. Pair end 50 means that both the reads will be 50 base pair or 100 base pair, both of them, okay? Then the sequencing core is going to ask you, okay, what about the barcodes? The single index, dual index. So single index means that we only use one index index one or index two. Dual index is when we are using two different indices during the library prep, and they can be a combination of the two, or they can be unique, okay? And this is important for the sample multiplexing part. And we can have any combination of the two. So we can have single and dual index. We can have single and single index and say pair and single index or pair and dual index. So the read length really depends on the experiment. So if we, here I'm giving you some examples. So 
single M50 is good enough for chip seek, RNA seek, uh, some application, um, uh, and small RNA sequence. Okay, single N100 is good enough for disulfide sequencing. Pair N50 or longer for ATAC seek or IC seek, and pair N100 is for RNA sequencing. If we want to look at splicing or some de novo trans, or we are performing some de novo transcription. Uh, and uh, we, we need the pair N100 for whole genome sequencing. So this is the same uh, with land scheme, just dividing like the parameters for each application. So if you are going to perform whole genome sequencing, you need to cover as much as you can. So 100 base pair is a good starting point, but if you can sequence more, it's even better. So you can even go up to 150 base pair. So cheap sequencing single and 50, uh, it's fine. You just need to think about that you will need, let's say at least one, uh, 50 million of uniquely mapped reads. Uh, so you will probably need to start with 25, 30 million of reads. So that's the calculation you, you need to do before submitting for sequencing. So you need to know how many million of reads you are going to obtain. This depends on the sequencing uh, machine you will use. So the ISIC uh, 4000 is usually giving you 400 million of reads. Uh, the NovaSeq has many different uh, running modes. So depending on what's the final output of reads uh, that coming from the machine you are using, you can calculate how many reads you need for each samples, and you can calculate how many samples you can put together in one uh, run, okay? So why I'm saying uh, if you need 20 million of uniquely mapped reads, you need to start with 25, 30 million of reads. So this is because of course, you are going to lose some reads in the first step of your uh, data analysis when you are removing you know, the, the low quality uh, reads. And when you are going to map the reads to your reference genome, you know, is not, will, won't be for sure a 100% efficient alignment. So you are going to lose some of your reads during the alignment step. So if you want 20 million of reads of uniquely mapped final reads, we need to start with some few more million of reads, okay? Then we have the RNA-seq. Uh, so for a regular differential uh, expression analysis, single N50 or even pair N50 is good enough. And even for RNA-seq, uh, you need 20, 25 million of market rates. So same calculation as before. But if you are looking at the splicing or you are doing some de novo transcriptum, um, you will need for sure longer reads. So pair N100 is a good start and you will need around 50, 100 million of reads or more for each sample, final reads, okay? Then we have the attack seek. Uh, there and 50, it's okay. If you can, you can go up to there and 100 and you need 50 million of, or, or more or of mapped reads. Uh, and this is because why you need so many reads here in the attack seek compared to the RNA seq or chip seq. 
So ataxic is an application that can, uh, unfortunately, sometimes you can have, uh, uh, you have high content of uh, mitochondrial um, DNA. Uh, there are some recently improved protocols that can uh, solve the issue, but you can still have some contamination, so it's better to have more uh, rates, okay? Because of course, the mitochondrial will be under the mapped rates, okay? Uh, then we have the high C, uh, so pair N50 or pair N100 should be okay, but we need a lot of rates. Uh, be a bisulfate sequencing or whole genome bisulfate sequencing, uh, single N or pair N100, it's the parameter to use. And whole genome bisulfate is one of the most expensive, or uh, bisulfate sequencing is one of the most expensive experiments because you really need many, many million of reads because the coverage needs to be deep. And RRBS, um, so for the RRBS, um, same as single M100 is good enough, uh, but you, you need less reads because the, the, the approach between these two, it's quite different. So, RRBS is not giving you the same information as the whole genome by sulfate, sulfate, of course, but it can save you money because you don't need same amount of reads. Okay, so how to choose the sequencer? As I told you, we have so many different sequencing machines. Uh, of course, as for any machine, uh, the newest is usually the better. So for example, so here for Illumina Novasic is the um, recent, uh, most recent machine and it's four times faster uh, compared to the IC. Um, and another, um, Pro of using the Novasic is the, the if you can multiplex many of your samples, you're really you're really going to save money. So why why to multiplex the samples in one single way in one single run? It's because so here, this is the, the, the Novasic system, the schema for the Novasic system and SP, S1, S2, S4 are the run, running modes for the Novasic. So as you can see, depending on the flow cell type, you can obtain different million of reads. So SP mode can cover for human genomes per run, going up to the S4 that can cover 48 human genomes per run. And even S4 is the most expensive one. If you calculate the cost per base, it, it's much, much cheaper compared to any other sequencing instrument. So let's take a, 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 a look at the cost. So these are, I'm, I'm not sure they are like, you know, 100% accurate because sometimes they change a bit. So we have two uh, sequencing core, core available uh, on campus. And they have more or less same, uh, uh, we actually have three sequencing core, sorry. Uh, prices are more or less same, okay? Um, I cannot say that they, th this 
price here is 100% accurate because they change uh, sometimes they change the price. Um, but uh, it's just to give you an idea on how cheap it becomes uh, to sequence a human genome when you go to the S4 platform. So SP cost per human genome is 1,150 versus 520 in the S4. So it's almost, yeah, it's out of the price. And of course, from SP to S4, this is the output in terms of data. So we are starting with just 250 gigabase up to 3,000 gigabase, okay? So the cost is everything about sample multiplexing. So of course, if you can here, if looking at the human genome, if you can multiplex 48 human genomes, uh, you can save money. Um, so if you can multiplex uh, your samples, uh, you will save money. Um, of course, it depends on your, uh, your own experiment. If you are planning to sequence hundreds of samples or uh, maybe even thousand, you should think about um, the S4 more. But of course, if you, are, if you don't need so many reads, there are still some other options. Okay? Okay, questions on the sequencing? Any questions? So let's have another break, uh, 10 minute break, uh, 10 minute break, and um, we will meet again at 3.32 for the final few slides I have for today. Okay. So I'm here, if you have any questions, just let me know. And feel free to use the uh, Excel sheet in the Google Drive to ask questions now or even later today. So let's meet again at uh, 3.32. So in one single step here, uh, we can combine the fragmentation and adapter ligation. So the transposase, they bring the adapters so they can cut and ligate the adapters. So we just discussed like variation on the DNA sequencing. So with the fragmentation and before by uh, using a streamlined protocol uh, compared to the multi-step multi protocol um, we saw at the real beginning of this class. Uh, I'm going to discuss the target capture sequencing uh, uh, now. Uh, and we are talking about all these specialty DNA library apps, so whole genome by sulfate sequencing, chip seek, attack seek tomorrow. Okay, how the target capture sequencing, uh, like the exon sequence, work? Um, so we we have in the target capture sequencing we have an extra step uh, compared to what we see so before uh, that's specific for the, this uh, type of library prep. 
and that's the hybridization factor. So we can use uh, biotinylated uh, probes to only capture some spe specific fragments, okay? So when we don't want to sequence uh, the whole genome, for example, um, or the whole transcriptome, we can just focus on some specific fragments. So we can design our probes to be able to capture just the, the, the sequence we are interested in. They can be uh, RNA probes or DNA probes, uh, and they are usually biotinylated. So here the biotin is in blue, or this blue dots. So what we are going to perform is an hybridization. So we will let our probes to capture the fragments we are interested in. So with streptavidine magnetic beads, so streptavidine will recognize the biotin. So we can separate the biotinylated fragments from everything else. So we, we can use a magnet to capture the magnetic beads that contain streptavidine, that can capture the biotin and just wash away everything else. So once we have the uh, capture fragments, we can wash, so it's just an illusion, same as we saw for the site selection with ampere beads. So first the beads will capture what we want, and then with the illusion step, we are going to release the DNA and then sequence it, okay? However, it's important to highlight that usually when we use the target sequencing, we are, we are only capturing a small fraction of our entire starting material, okay? So it's usually just one, two per percent of the entire genome. So here we have some uh, commercial available bits. Uh, so you can see like how many, so how many probes they provide and the probe land and how much the capture will cost. Uh, for you and um, anyway, it's just a, fra a fraction of the entire genome. So how, I mean, once we wash away almost, you know, 80, sorry, 98% of the, our starting material, like, what we should do with 2%, I mean, 2% is nothing. So it would be detectable uh, at the sequencing machine. If we just have this little amount of DNA, it will be useful? No. So once we wa wash and we, once we uh, would sorry, our DNA before sequencing, what we need to do? PCR, yes. So the step we talk about as it's useless, uh, it's better not to perform. In this case, it's extremely necessary because we only are, cap we are capturing only 2% of the entire genome. So we need PCR to have enough final library to be sequenced, okay? So now, the PCR duplicates, it becomes, can be a, a, an issue, can be a problem. So how we can detect PCR duplicates? So we have two different strategies. 
that's the, the, the old school ones. So uh, we usually, so we can use the alignment position. That's the silico approach. So we have, uh, so it, here in this thing, each read is um, different, like we have different colors here. Um, so the in silico approach is assuming that if you have reads that will that start and end at, at the same exact position, like the red, orange, blue, uh, light blue and blue here. Oh no, sorry, the blue one is longer actually. So this three here, they start and end at the same exact position. So they will probably be uh, just PCR duplicates because it's really unlikely that multiple reads are starting and ending at the same exact position since the you know, fragmentation uh, it's random or anyway, it's really unlikely. So we, during the data analysis, we are going to say, okay, these three are not three different molecules. They are coming from the same initial uh, fragment. It's just PCR artifacts. So total number of molecules here is just one, two, three, and four, okay, four. Or we can use UMI. So what are the UMIs? UMIs, UMI stands for Unique Molecular Identifier. So it's a short sequence, uh, usually age 16 nucle nucleotides, um, to uniquely label a molecule of nucleic acid in order to reduce the bias introduced by PCR. Okay, so while the index is labeling the sample for the multiplexing, the multiplexing, here the UMI is uniquely labeling a single molecule, okay? So usually it's close to the bar, it's close to the adapter, it can be, okay, here or sometimes the UMI sequences next to the index, okay? So UMI is different from library barcodes, okay? So UMI, they can be random. So just a random sequence of eight, 10, whatever nucleotides. So here you can see that we have UMI1, UMI2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So even if these three molecules with the stars are mapping in the same exact position, they have different UMIs. So we can actually say, okay, now, they are not coming from the same initial molecule because they have different UMIs. So since the UMI is labeling uniquely the molecule, they are three different molecules. So total number of read, the total number of molecules here is six because we have six different, different UMIs. However, we can also choose to pre-design the UMI. So we can decide the sequence of the UMIs, okay? So in this case, if we have pre-designed UMIs, we can say, oh, wait, UMI two and three are different, yes, but this one, I didn't design that. So it's not a pre-designed sequence. So even if they differ, uh, by one nucleotide, it's probably just a PCR artifact, OK? 
okay? So it's not a, a real difference, it's just an artifact. And we can remove the molecule too, because it's not a pre-designed sequence. And now we can adjust the number to be five molecules, not six. Of course, pre-designed UMIs, it's time consuming and more expensive than just random UMIs, okay? So random UMIs is the most common uh, UMIs you will find, okay? Okay, so question on the target sequence and UMIs, any question here? 